Hello everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Mark Hickson. I'm a software engineer here at Docker. and I'm here to talk to you about our new API first strategy. What it means, how it benefits us, how it could benefit you. And later in the talk, I will demonstrate usage of one of our APIs. So to start with, what do we mean by API first? Uh, it's not something we've invented here at Docker. It's a set of philosophies and principles that are gaining traction within the API space. And it can be summed up with a few basic tenets. So to start with, uh, it means thinking of your APIs as uh, the primary user interface of your application. So that doesn't mean that it's the way that most users will interact with your application, um, but it means thinking of APIs as fundamental building blocks. Uh, this often isn't the case. Um, it's very common for a company to build a website and then several years down the line uh, to release an API or a CLI that allows users to automate some subset of the functionality of that website. And that's an approach where you're defining your API relative to your website. API first is about flipping that relationship so that your uh, API is a separate product in itself that can be uh, released potentially before uh, any UI features. And the UI features simply become the first or early consumers of that API. And it also means separating a, uh, an API from its implementation. So uh, an API should be thought of as an abstract thing that can be designed and refined long before a line of code is written. Uh, and a major benefit of this is that your API uh, can be refactored, can be moved from to a new programming language, to a new framework, to a new platform, uh, or without users ever having to know. And one of the ways this is made possible is with document documentation, ideally public, ideally, ideally uh, defined by a formal specification, uh, which we'll talk about in a little while. Uh, and lastly, your API should not be defined by a single use case. Uh, it's tempting to just build a thing to drive whatever feature you're working on at the time. But the longer term approach is to think of your APIs as representing some kind of semantic thing within your organization uh, so that you, your API is very general purpose and it can be used to solve use cases that you haven't even thought of yet. So most of this talk is about how this uh, strategy benefits you as our users um, and how to use our APIs. But since we probably have a few engineers in the audience, it may be interesting to you to talk about some of the benefits we've found internally and that you may find uh, if you apply it in your own organization. So possibly the main benefit is a decoupling, both of teams and of disciplines. Um, one problem if you have separate front-end and back-end engineers is you can get into a situation where front-end engineers can't work on features without uh, bringing in back-end engineers, uh, which slows things down. It means people are blocked on the availability of other people. Um, whereas if you have very general purpose APIs that are defined uh, formally um, in advance of an implementation, then it means engineers on the front end are free to experiment, innovate, get creative, uh, and possibly even build their side of a feature um, before the API is even implemented, because they can build against uh, a mocked server. Again, we'll talk about that a bit more later. And it separates teams from one another as well. Um, one of the things that prevents companies from scaling is uh, that early on in a company's life, it may be that any individual engineer needs to know a lot about the overall technical ecosystem of your organization. Um, but Dividing companies into teams that each have responsibility over a small set of APIs um, allows you to reduce the silhouette, the technical silhouette of your ecosystem so that individual engineers only really need to understand the APIs of the other teams in the organization and not the implementations. Different teams can use different techniques, different technologies, uh, and then they just interact <clears throat> by means of API specs in one direction and feature requests and bug reports in the other. So I've mentioned formal specs a few times. Um, they are very awesome. 
they're not an essential part of doing API first, but the two go hand in hand really well. Uh, we're using OpenAPI 2 for this, also known as Swagger, uh, which is a way of formally specifying an API such that it can be acted on by a number of, uh, a number of tools that already exist. So uh, one great thing you can do is you can generate your specs from your code. This might not be how you first create your specs. You might handwrite your specs to begin with. Um, and then once they've been refined and code has been written, you can switch to generating specs from code to make sure the two stay in sync. Uh, and also you can do the inverse. You can generate code from specs. That could be things like test suites or tools to do uh, load testing. Uh, and a cool use case is if you are deriving your specs from your code, then you can start to treat your spec as a proxy for your code. You can define linting rules over them, uh, over these files, which will generally be JSON or YAML, things that are easy to uh, write logic over. And you can do things like asserting that every endpoint must follow a particular structure, or must uh, have authentication information associated with them. Because if those rules ever fail at your lint stage, then uh, it may mean that someone has forgotten to secure an endpoint. Uh, one benefit to us internally as well is it discourages our users from reverse engineering our, our stuff. So I'm sure a lot of the people here have at some point scraped a website to get data out of it or looked at a network tab to try and figure out uh, how the website is using an API so that they can use it themselves. Um, but that gives us some problems internally. It means that uh, you'll probably do something wrong. You'll probably use an API in the wrong way because you don't have the documentation. And we'll see errors in our error tracking. And also we'll feel bad if we make some changes that break your stuff. Uh, and a huge benefit, especially if you have a community like Docker's, is that if you provide APIs, then people have proven, you all have proven, that you will go out and build stuff. Useful tools like IDE plugins, CI integrations, CLI tools, dashboards, and lots of things that I haven't thought of, but you probably will. Uh, and one last cool feature um, is uh, APIs, API usage can be a form of democracy. So uh, whenever we design a feature of a, let's say, a website, there's a certain amount of informed guesswork about what use cases users are interested in and will mostly use. And there are a number of ways you can test those assumptions. After you've made a feature, you can, uh, you can use focus groups, you can use feedback mechanisms. Uh, to tell you if the feature you've created is resonating with users. But you can also use um, uh, an API, an open API, um, because you can create an API, you can observe how users are using it, and by analyzing the data, you may discover entire use cases you hadn't considered that users are using, and then you get to this feedback loop where you enhance your API or your UI to uh, reflect those use cases, and users discover new use cases and uh, rinse and repeat. So that's why it's great for us. Uh, it's also great for you. Um, it's primarily great for you. Uh, again, formal specs are awesome, uh, even more so as a consumer than as a maintainer of an application. So as a consumer, you can generate clients to interact with an API, uh, which takes a lot of manual work away. We'll see that in the demo later. Uh, which may let you do things like learning about deprecation early because you, if you are automatically bringing down a spec and building clients from it, then you will start to see deprecation uh, notices popping up in your warnings at build time. Uh, and you can also build against dummy servers. Um, you can, there are lots of situations where you may not want to build against an actual live service, either because your whatever you're building does some destructive operation because it, there's something exotic about the use case that means you don't have data for it. Or maybe you're using an API that you don't have access to yet because you're early in your rapid prototyping and you haven't upgraded to a pro or team plan yet. And then there's the usual benefits as well for any API. Uh, the flexibility you get from dealing with fundamentals directly, 
the stability you get from knowing that a API is documented, you haven't re just reverse engineered it. Uh, you know that our APIs will not change in ways that will break your code. And of course, documentation uh, will help you in your implementation and may alert you to uh, features of an API that you wouldn't have known about if you were just reverse engineering. So now we'll move on to a practical demo and see what we can do in about 15 minutes with one of our APIs. So what's the problem we're going to solve today? We're going to put ourselves in the shoes of a maintainer of this repository, which represents some kind of business critical service. We've come into work and we've been told that over a period of time, a number of problematic images have been pushed to this repository. They could be bad in a number of different ways. Um, they Maybe they have cryptograph cryptographic secrets baked into them due to a faulty Docker file. Uh, maybe they have um, some kind of critical security vulnerabilities that uh, the user may have discovered earlier if they'd used our vulnerability scanning feature. Whatever the reason, we know we have to delete uh, any image pushed between two dates. Now, the manual way to do this is to go into the image management dashboard here and tick a number of different rows and delete them. That might work if the number of images to delete is small, if we're dealing with only a single repository, um, and it will work if our criteria are quite simple, um, like everything within a date range, but it, they could be more complicated. Um, so anything more complicated than that, and um, it's going to become very arduous to uh, to do this. It's going to be very error prone. I may del I may miss rows. I may delete some some things I didn't mean to delete. This is the kind of thing that's really best done by a computer. So luckily, the API that drives this interface is one of the ones that we've uh, documented in our API first initiative. So I can come to my favorite, uh, my, my search engine of choice and just search for Docker Hub API and we'll get this as our first result. It takes us here. This is a page generated from our, our open API spec. Uh, a lot of different details in here that we could peruse through, but what we're really interested in is the specification file itself. We're going to download download that. I've taken the liberty of doing that already, and we're going to build an API client out of it. So our next step would be to go to the Swagger CodeGen project, look at our options in terms of languages and environments. And since it's the season of JavaScript here at Docker, we're going to make a TypeScript project based on Node. So I've already started filling in some of the uh, scaffolding for this, um, but we're going to go through the actual API interactions now. So as I said, I've already pre-downloaded the Swagger definition file. I've also got the code gen uh, binary. Um, so I'm ready to generate my, my client object. So let's run this command. And we should see a new directory appear. In here, we have a TypeScript file that's full of interfaces, um, definitions, lots of code that we don't write. We don't have to write ourselves, which is nice. When you, you normally wouldn't peruse this file, um, we're just going to go straight ahead and start using it. So, our first step is to authenticate. We use a bearer token model of authentication. Um, the general way that authentication works, um, sorry, API interactions work with these Swagger code gen clients is we're going to use API objects. So TypeScript is helping us out, it's giving us suggestions. Um, and uh, so we can very quickly, if we know what endpoints we're dealing with, start writing code against it. So our username is our namespace. And for password, we could put our, our account password directly into it. Um, and maybe that'll work for this scenario. Um, but if this 
script is going to uh, get checked into source control, it's going to be shared between multiple people, then I probably don't want to put my password in here. So what we're going to do instead is get an access token. This is really what these are for, um, for these scenarios where you want some kind of automated use of uh, our services. So I'm going to make an access token specifically for the script. Um, you can create multiple of these um, depending on your plan. Um, the, you'll be able to create different numbers of these. Um, we've created our access token. Now we're going to put that in here. Um, it's worth saying this is not something we can do today. Um, I'm using kind of preview functionality here. Um, at the moment, you can only authenticate with these APIs with your username and password, but that's something that's um, being worked on as we speak. So pretty soon you'll be able to do what I'm showing you here. Um, now, once we've posted to this service, we'll get back an object which should have a token field on it. Uh, and we can use that in our next step. So uh, once we've authenticated, we need to, so the, the endpoint that lists the images within the repository is paged. So we need to know how many pages of data to retrieve. So we're going to hit one of the endpoints whoops, um, that gets statistics on our repository. So, but before we do that, we have to use our token that we just generated. Um, so let's start by making a, an images API object, just the same as the authentication API object we made earlier. Um, every one of these API objects that Swagger's generated for us has a set default authentication method. So we need to provide something in here um, based on our token. So um, we can just make an auth object. Now, this is a bit misleading. Um, in OpenAPI 2, there's no built-in support for bearer token style authentication. Um, there is an Open, OpenAPI 3, which we may use in the future. Um, but from the point where you already have a bearer token, the process is identical. So we're going to use this OAuth um, class. It's a little bit misleading, but it will have the desired effect. So we're going to set the access token field on it. And now we can provide that to our set default authentication uh, method to set up our API. And now we should be able to make requests on the API. Um, so as I said, we're going to start by retrieving uh, information on our repository um, and that's going to tell us how many pages we need to request so let's destructure the results of that into a new variable our number of pages will be uh, equal to the total number of um, images within our repository divided by the page size. Now, I happen to know that's 100. Uh, if you don't know it's 100, then you will find it soon enough. Um, I'll show you that shortly. Um, so our next step is to actually uh, go through these pages and retrieve some data. So I'm going to use this utility method that's just generating an array of page numbers. And I'm going to map each of them to a promise that comes back from our images API object. Again, providing namespace, repository. Um, this has a lot of different options that can be provided. We don't really care about most of them because we're not trying to filter down this list. We want to just get the entire set. And I mentioned page size earlier. Because uh, that information is in the Swagger file, uh, because this client is generated from that, we have these nice 
inline bits of documentation um, served directly to us. So we know that the maximum page size is 100. So let's fill that in. Now we've got a, an array of promises. Let's start those all at the same time because we're not going to be dealing with too many pages of data. Um, and let's await that. And then we're going to take each of those results and extract out the images from them. So as usual with these client objects, we get a body parameter, a body property in the, um, the return object. And if we can sort our typings, so we can see there's a results field. That's an array of image objects. So let's turn our array of um, API results into an array of uh, images. And then, then let's filter them down based on our date range. So you can see I've made a function in advance that just filters everything made with, between these two dates. Um, so let's pass in the, the push date. And then once we've got our filtered list, let's turn it into a list of digests to be passed to the deletion endpoint. So now we're ready to start deleting. So again, we go back to our images API object and pass it in a more complicated, uh, we're posting now, so let's pass in some more details. Um, a lot of these we don't care about. They're more useful if you want to validate the results of a deletion. Um, but we are happy to just go ahead and delete this stuff. This would come back with an with a warning if, for instance, any of the things we asked to delete were active or currently tagged. Um, but that's not the case in our dummy data. So we can just go ahead and provide this list of manifest objects, um, which are a combination of a digest and a repository. And then finally, let's, let's just log to the console uh, to let us know that we've succeeded. So we're ready to run. This is going to go off, make a number of requests to the back end, and with a lot of luck, we've successfully deleted 56 images. So let's go back to our image dashboard. Now, I believe we had 470, sorry, 721 images before. And now if we refresh here, then we should see we've decremented by 56. So we've succeeded in our task. We've deleted some images. So we've seen what you can do with a short amount of time in a single API. Um, but if you have more time, you combine multiple APIs, you can, of course, achieve more complicated things. So for instance, by combining the image management API that we've just used with the registry API or with command line Docker push, we can do things like selectively rolling a tag back to a previous state by finding out with the management, image management API what image uh, previously held a tag and pushing it over that tag. Uh, or we can simulate uh, renaming a repository of splitting it into two by running through the images in that repository and pushing them to a new repo. Or we can adopt a new tagging strategy by, uh, sc again, scanning through the images in a repository and pushing them to new tags. What APIs are available now? So we've just seen the advanced image management API that lets you list the images in your repos and interact with them. There's also the audit logs API that lets you, uh, that's, that's what powers the activity tab in Docker Hub and lets you see what's going on in your organization. Addition of new teams, 
creation of new repositories, that kind of thing. And then there's also the registry itself, which uh, conforms to the OCI distribution specification. Uh, it's worth mentioning the top two of these uh, are the proprietary APIs on this list are both restricted to paid plans, the pro and team plans. That's not a general uh, part of our API strategy. Um, there's no uh, intention to restrict API use to, to uh, paid plans. It's just simply the uh, two APIs that we've created since adopting the API first uh, approach. So that's my rundown on API development here at Docker. I hope you're all excited to go out and build things with the APIs as we release them. Um, I'm very grateful to you all for attending, and I hope you enjoy the rest of DockerCon. <laughs>